So let's pick up where we left off. Uh, we're going to start talking about model parallelism. Uh, in contrast to data parallelism, which has these kind of diminishing returns as you add more replicas, either because your batch size increases a lot if you're doing synchronous training, or your, the noise in the, the asynchrony causes things to kind of uh, just not perform as well. Uh, model parallelism, where you take the computation your model wants to do and spread that across multiple devices or perhaps multiple machines, Actually, if you can get all those devices working uh, at the same time because of inherent parallelism in the model, that actually is the, much, the best way to make your training, uh, to decrease your training time, is decrease the step time. Um, and the real problem is how do you actually distribute the work that you need to perform so the communication doesn't kill you? And one nice property a lot of models have is that they have kind of structures that lend themselves well to having the communication not kill you. So in convolutional models, for example, uh, you, you tend to have local connectivity. And that means that you only need to communicate a relatively small bit of stuff on the boundary, as I'll show you in a minute, uh, when you decide to split up things uh, kind of by slicing it like a cake. Um, you can also have multiple towers in a model with relatively little communication or maybe no communication between the towers. Uh, the original AlexNet paper for ImageNet uh, demonstrated this with two towers that sort of only exchanged values every few layers rather than every layer. Um, and I think a more promising way in the future is to have very large models that are only sort of partially activated for particular examples. So a given example might turn on only 1% of the, the computation of the model. And that seems like a much better way of approaching very large models than what we're doing today, which is basically throwing the same amount of computation at every example, regardless of how hard or, or easy it is. Um, and also not allowing pieces of the model to really specialize on, on different kinds of uh, data. Um, sort of the same model, the whole model has to be active for every example, prevents that a bit. Um, and there's many ways to exploit model parallelism. So on a single core uh, in, on CPUs, you often have instructions that can do four or eight multiply add operations at a time, and that's pretty much free. Like basically your compiler hopefully will, will vectorize your, your inner loop, or if, it, if it's not, it's pretty easy to, to do it. Um, and then across multiple CPU cores, you have thread parallelism. So you can take little bits of your computation and have them be done by, by different uh, threads. Um, across devices, uh, you, you can essentially split things and then have communication across the GPU cards in a machine, for example. Uh, that's often limited by the PCIe bandwidth available in your machine, uh, although more modern GPUs, uh, like the new Pascal card from, from NVIDIA, the P100, uh, will have more customized interconnect uh, thing, uh, um, networks that will give much higher bandwidth than just uh, PCIe cards. And across machines, you're often limited by the network bandwidth and also by latency somewhat for how quickly activations can get from one place to another. Uh, but model parallelism basically is this idea that you have a model that looks like that. And uh, often in these models you have, for example, in a convolutional model, you have these local receptive fields that mean that if you partition the model this way, uh, you, you really don't need to communicate that much data for the activations of the model across network boundaries or across device boundaries. Basically only this, uh, stuff that spans the partition one, partition two boundary, do you need to do any communication for? Everything else is local, remains local to its particular partition. Um, so let's look at a few ways that you use TensorFlow to express these different kinds of parallelism. So uh, the, the hope is that we can have fairly minimal changes to single device model code without any model or data parallelism and uh, get pretty good um, uh, representations of both of those things. 
So I think we already talked about this. We, I said you have the ability to specify hints about where different computations should be performed, either a full-on naming of a particular device, or you can give um, sort of general constraints, like I want this on a GPU, some GPU, I don't care which one, um, or that it has to be on this particular job, this particular GPU, for example. And then the placement algorithm, uh, oh, I guess I won't do that. That was a leftover. Uh, plus a cost model, then about how, how long different nodes take to execute and also how big the tensors are that are flowing around in the graph can make uh, placement decisions. And currently we have a pretty simple greedy algorithm, but as I said, I think this would be a pretty interesting uh, problem. We have some people starting to work on it. Um, to actually do a machine learning based approach to doing placement. Isn't it more like an optimization problem? Uh, sort of, except you want to generalize to new graphs that you've never seen before. Uh, and because you know every TensorFlow model is slightly different. And if you learn a lot from this inception model, it'd be nice to take what you've learned about what placements worked well for that and take this slightly modified inception model that maybe only has a different output layer and mostly do the right thing. Um, so let's see. Uh, now I'd like to talk a bit about, uh, actually I don't know. Oh yeah, so different kinds of models and how they've been used within Google products. So um, one of the um, main things that uh, various computer vision tasks have been used for is to produce uh, some pretty important features in our new Google Photos product. Uh, now that you can actually understand what's in an image from the pixels, that, that leads to a few nice features. So one is you can essentially cluster a user's photographs by what they contain. So here's my pictures of cars and birthdays or whatever, uh, sky. And then you can also search even though you haven't actually tagged uh, these photos. And so you can find your pictures of Siamese cats or whatever. Um, a general trend we've seen is that the same model uh, architecture can often be reused for completely different problems with relatively modest uh, changes or maybe no changes other than training it on different data. Um, so here are three examples where we've used a general model structure for given an image, predict interesting pixels. And uh, uh, the reason that's important is that it means you can come up with solutions that work well for this kind of class of problems and they can be repurposed across lots of different uh, um, product areas or, or features. So uh, this is work that my summer intern, Matt Zeeler and I did in conjunction with some people in the Street View team where they wanted to be able to eventually OCR all the text in the Street View images and obviously the first task there is to find the text. Um, so we trained a, a model to essentially predict, you know, a, a heat map of which pixels contained text. And it actually, you can't quite tell, but there's like a, 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 a non-illuminated fluorescent sign in the window that actually has some text and it picked up on a little bit of that. Um, and it generally works pretty well. It, it finds text in lots of different fonts and some of it is very close to the camera, some of it is very far away, different colors. Um, and that same model was actually able to be repurposed for looking at satellite imagery and trying to find rooftops. Uh, someone put together this nice little side project that could actually tell you, given your street address, how much solar area you would actually have available to install solar panels and how much energy you could generate with those solar panels because it could also estimate the, the angle of the roof and knows the orientation relative to the sun um, most of the year. And then another application that essentially wants the same kind of underlying model is uh, various medical imaging applications where you have um, you know, an image and you want to find interesting parts of the image, in this case, uh, parts that are um, indications of diabetic retinopathy, which is a degenerative eye disease. And this, this same general model gives very good results. I can't reveal them here, but there's a journal paper uh, coming out soon about the, the results here, which are quite 
I don't believe they wrote a paper about it. They just released it. So you can go to google.com slash sunroof and, and try it, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, one thing I will say here that's, that's slightly terrifying and why I think machine learning will have a big impact on healthcare is that uh, in order to do this, they had to get images labeled by board certified ophthalmologists about grading these images one, two, three, four, or five, you know, where five means very severe and one means mild. And the difference in treatment protocol for two versus three is actually pretty different. So two means, yeah, yeah, come back in a year. And three means uh, we better get you in next week. Um, and so the inter-rater agreement, if we got it rated by two board certified ophthalmologists, they agreed on the number one through five 60% of the time which is, is a little terrifying. But the more terrifying number is intra-rater agreement. <laughs> Three hours later, it's 65%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, in order to reduce variance, they actually had to get this data set labeled by a large number of ophthalmologists per image. Uh, so it's, it's a challenging problem. I mean. It may be that just humans don't have a really clear definition of the difference between a two and a three. Um, so all, a lot of the AlphaGo work, uh, you can think of as similar to computer vision models in essence. They're trying to recognize interesting patterns and then make predictions based on those patterns of um, sort of the move evaluation uh, neural net in this uh, wants to, given all the possible places you could move, identify the three or four that are actually really interesting places to, to consider moving and ignore the rest, because that allows you to reduce the branching factor and make much more effective use of Monte Carlo tree search um, to explore the interesting possibilities rather than wasting computation on sort of all possibilities. Um, Another area that we've actually deployed neural nets is in our search ranking function. And this was a kind of an interesting problem. This relates back to that initial example where I showed you, you know, this query and we want this document to be a good match for that, even though, you know, it doesn't really have many words in common. And the nice smooth representations that you get from uh, kind of word embeddings and, and uh, sequence models tend to give you pretty nice characteristics in terms of matching up based on the meaning rather than the, the sort of raw, raw surface forms of the word. Um, our search ranking group has traditionally um, wanted very explainable kinds of models for when they use machine learning in the ranking function. So this was a bit of a, a you know, a case, we do see this case where uh, for certain applications, people have stronger or less strong desires for interpretability and less opaqueness. Um, in this case, we were actually able to sort of build some debugging tools that allowed them to get enough understanding of what the model was actually doing that they became comfortable enough to launch this. And, you know, it's good that they did because it's now the third most important ranking signal. But I do think that uh, there are domains, uh, search ranking, healthcare kinds of uh, applications where um, doing research on how to interpret what's going on in these models and why they're emitting particular answers will be pretty interesting uh, to work on. Um, the, a nice property we have is that it's pretty easy to insert whatever probes to gather data about what's going on inside the model. Uh, we just need kind of to understand what, what kinds of visualizations and other tools actually aid that. So yeah. Are you able to say something about the, the gains that were obtained by using deep learning for, for this? Uh, yes, a little bit. So basically it's the third most important ranking signal and uh, it was the m most important uh, oh, how many? Uh, hundreds. Oh, hundreds. Yeah. Uh, and it was also uh, the biggest search quality single launch in several years. So the biggest in delta for a single launch in several years. So uh, pretty, pretty big deal. I think. Um, okay, so one of the things people like about TensorFlow is 
you can use it in this mode that's pretty close to what you actually see in machine learning research papers, where if you actually want to control at a fine granularity exactly what, uh, what equations are being used and, and what operations you're performing, you can do that. But then you can bundle that up in kind of these reusable cells uh, that allow people to um, essentially make, uh, use these as higher level components. So the sequence to sequence model that uh, Ilya Sutzgaver and Oriel Vignals and Kwok Lee came up with a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago now, um, is actually proven to be pretty powerful in general for a lot of different kinds of, of uh, machine learning problems. Uh, and it sounds very vague and abstract where you have an input sequence and you want to map that to an output sequence. Uh, I don't, have you covered this, this model? You covered it this morning? Okay, so I will not cover that. Uh, but it, in general, it's proven to be pretty interesting because you can have various twists and tweaks on it that, that allow it to do very different things. Um, and a lot of the stuff that Suma talked about in terms of attention and memory models are uh, sort of really, really nice follow-on work to the basic sequence-to-sequence -sequence model that really improve it and allow it to keep track of longer range dependencies and other information. Um, and you can see just in like a year, it spawned like a huge amount of interesting follow-on work. Um, and one, one bit of work that's kind of fun was the image captioning work that uh, it seems like six research groups around the world simultaneously decided that the time was right to do image captioning. Uh, and they all had slightly different tweaks on it. I guess they all posted papers on archive within a week of each other, mostly. Uh, this was the work that uh, Oriel and others at Google did. Uh, essentially, you rip off the encoder and replace it with a convolutional neural model and use the sort of top level activations of the, the pixel uh, the, that come from the raw pixels as the initialization of the state for generating a caption. Um, and I thought this was the coolest thing I'd seen in a while, that it can actually generate real sort of plausible sentences for new images. Uh, they're, you know, they're obviously not quite, this is a test image the model's never seen before. And these are a couple of samples from the, the probability distribution over sentences from the model. And it's not quite as subtle as what the human is saying. This is the human generated caption for that test image. But it generally seems pretty plausible and is, is pretty good. Um, uh, one important bit is it, it, you can't get discouraged at first because the initial models that we had didn't look that good and then we sort of improved our training protocol a bit, we changed the model a little bit and uh, the model tended to get quite a lot better. Uh, so that's not a man cutting a cake with a knife but it sure is a man holding a sandwich in his hand. Um, and you know, generally, generally best model better than initial model, and human better than best model, I guess. Uh, when it's wrong, it's sort of amusing, I guess. It's, <laughs> if, you, if you look very closely, I assure you, there's a snowboard, it's just below the, the frame of the picture. And that, that's actually three pizzas, not two. They're just on two pans. Um, and you, here again, you see the, um, the caption is not as subtle as what a human would say. The human would probably say they're serving a tennis ball or something. But I think that's mostly just the, the fact that this training set is not that big. If we had much more labeled data for this, it would just generally do much better. Um, so this is work that Oriel and uh, Mera Fortunato and Naibdeep Daily did on uh, kind of seeing if the sequence to sequence model could actually be used to solve interesting uh, graph algorithms. In particular, they wanted to see if you could get approximate solutions to the traveling salesman problem and also find convex hulls uh, given a bunch of points. And it turns out uh, it works. Uh, which was kind of cool. Uh, the slight tweak on the sequence to sequence model that's used here is you essentially don't train the model to emit X5 and Y5, you train it to emit position five. So it's sort of emitting an indirect reference to 
the input data rather than emitting the actual values of the input data. And that seemed to be the trick that made this work well, whereas trying to train it to emit the actual points was much harder and wasn't nearly as effective. Um, neural conversational models obviously is an extension of sequence to sequence stuff where instead of English and French, you have person one and person two dialogue and you try to learn to emulate good responses given some context. Um, and along those lines, uh, we launched a feature called Smart Reply sort of based on the sequence to sequence model. Uh, actually, it turns out Google had posted an April Fool's joke in 2009 saying, Google will start replying to your email automatically. Uh, but then we launched that, which was kind of good. <laughs> um, and it's actually quite a big help on mobile devices because it essentially comes up with a pretty good reply and you can just press a button and you don't have to type anything. And so people really actually like that. So 10% of all mobile inbox replies are now generated with these, these models. It was a pretty big deal. Um, and to make this more computationally tractable, we have a small neural net we've trained to predict, is this the kind of message where a short reply that we could plausibly generate makes sense? And then if so, we kick up the big LSTM machinery and uh, actually apply it. And so here's an example. Uh, one of my colleagues received an email from his brother. Hi, we wanted to invite you for an early Thanksgiving. Please bring your favorite dish next week. And the model predicts, you know, count us in, we'll be there, or sorry, we won't be able to make it which seems pretty plausible. Uh, and that, that works pretty well. Uh, OK, so let's say that we have our little LSTM cell building block. Um, so one thing that uh, the sequence to sequence paper found was that adding depth to these kinds of uh, uh, recurrent models, where you have multiple layers of activity for each time step, actually is pretty helpful. So here's the changes you might make in TensorFlow to um, do that. Uh, it's a little, little messy, but essentially a little bit of Python uh, changes to make everything an array rather than a uh, just simple variable. And now you have a deep LSTM. Uh, with some device hints, you can actually say, I'd like you know, layer one to run on GPU zero, layer, well, layer zero to run on GPU zero, layer one to run on GPU one and so on. And then what that means is you now have this really nice model parallelism set up so that you have four GPU cards. And after one time step, only one GPU card is active. But after two, the first two GPU cards are actually active. And after three time steps, the, all three are active and so on. And so now you have all the GPU cards pretty much working um, uh, flat out on this particular problem. And it's only kind of at the, the ragged front and the ragged end of, of the parallelism, especially because you unroll quite a number of steps. Mostly, they're all active all the time. And the amount of state you need to transfer here is actually relatively small, because it's the number of activations in the LSTM cells, which is you know order thousands of, of numbers per, per element of the match. Um, so it's actually fairly bandwidth efficient uh, in terms of cross GPU bandwidth. And that allows you to train sort of pretty deep LSTMs with model parallelism with you know, relatively modest changes to the TensorFlow code. And obviously, ideally, we'd like to not have to need that. Um, so another thing that the TensorFlow system supports uh, are queues. Um, and we found these pretty useful in a lot of different circumstances. So um, essentially, you can have a queue, and then you can have operations that in queue into the queue, and operations that dequeue into from the queue. Um, and the dequeue can either like take what's available, or it can say, "I only want to take uh, when there are 64 elements available in the queue." Um, and we found this pretty useful for different kinds of things. So one is input prefetching. Suppose you have an input preprocessing where you need to decode movie frames or something, and that's relatively expensive and might run at a very different rate than the actual you know, per frame convolutional model or something. You can actually stuff frames in the queues uh, 
uh, and then DQ them and sort of separate out the computation needed here and needed here. Or maybe this kind of computation can run on a different machine. Uh, it also, also allows us to group similar examples. So for training translation models, we often group uh, mini batches by rough sentence length so that we tend to group everything that's between 16 and 20 words long into a batch so that our unrolling through time uh, actually has roughly the same amount of unrolling needed for every element of the batch. And we also have kind of slightly modified queues that can do randomization or shuffling of a large number of elements. So you can, might have a queue of 10 million things and we can dequeue a random example, a random mini batch of 64 things from that queue. Uh, so it's not a FIFO queue, it's sort of a randomizing queue. And that, that sometimes is helpful if your data in your training set is not necessarily randomized. Right, so um, we actually have, yeah. I was just saying we group by. So this is a TensorFlow model without any data parallelism. And uh, um, I think this has actually gotten a little bit better more recently. But if you want to sort of control carefully how things happen in terms of data parallelism, you can have this thing which will say, I'd like to use 10 parameter devices to spread my parameters out over. And then any parameter variables you set up in the model will just get randomly spread across those parameter devices. Um, and you can have a supervisor which takes care of uh, one of the, essentially the replica zero is gonna be special for data parallel training in that it's gonna control the rate at which we decide to checkpoint the model parameters and restore them uh, if needed. Um, but essentially, and then we're also gonna keep track of the total number of global steps done by all replicas in the model as another variable in the model. And so we're gonna have all these local copies uh, of the model stop once we've hit, say, a million steps globally or 10,000 steps or whatever makes sense. Um, so there's uh, a fair amount of flexibility and control in doing this. It's, it's a little bit clunky and we have some higher level layers that, that make this easier. Um, Okay, uh, so another area that we've been using TensorFlow a fair amount uh, for research is in uh, robotics. And we're doing a fair amount of work on both reinforcement learning for robotics, but also uh, we've discussed, one of the people who's working uh, part-time in our group, Sergey Levine, who uh, was in Peter Beale's group at, at Berkeley, um, had discovered when he was at Google that we had 20 unused arms from a robotics company we'd, we'd acquired and they were discontinuing this model. They were just kind of sitting there. Uh, so we set up a lab with these 20 arms in it. Uh, they're hard to get parts for since they're discontinued, but um, for the moment they, they do good stuff. And uh, we're using those as a parallel uh, experimentation framework for various robotics tasks. And in particular, one of the things we did was um, had the robots learn to grasp objects from scratch. Um, and essentially, this is a supervised task because you can grasp the object, and if your gripper doesn't close all the way, then you succeeded, and if it closes all the way, you failed. Um, so you can essentially just dump objects in front of the, the robots, and there's a end-to-end -end model here that goes from camera inputs above the robot's shoulder um, directly to six different torque motor controls for the joints of the robot. Another thing that we tend to do is uh, to minimize the amount of data we send across the network uh, by dropping the precision of values involved in communication. So in particular, if we have some floating point values here and we need to get them to the other side, you can actually insert uh, things that reduce the precision on one side and sort of get back the precision uh, in some way on the other side. And one technique we found works surprisingly well is just lopping off 16 bits of the mantissa and sending 16 bits. So, and then on the other side, you actually can fill in zeros because that's cheaper than doing the right probabilistic rounding. Um, 
And that seems to work reasonably well and sort of has the network bandwidth you need to, to send these values around. Um, one thing I'll note is this format actually seems more amenable to uh, reduce precision computation than the IEEE 16-bit format, which we've observed um, seems to keep uh, too many mantissa bits and not enough exponent bits. Here, we basically preserve all the exponent bits of the full 32-bit floating point format um, and recover them on the other side. Uh, well, not recover, preserve them. Um, another thing that's pretty important for making some of these models efficient, especially on mobile phones, is that you can quantize your model, including the weights of the model and also the activations, often down to 8-bit fixed point arithmetic. Um, and that, that really works well for mobile, mobile devices because most of them can do four 8-bit uh, operations per cycle rather than one 32-bit uh, operation. And so with quantization, a high-end smartphone, you know, this isn't super high-end, but a reasonably high-end smartphone can run an inception model at not quite real time, but six frames per second, something like that. Um, now at that rate, it's, it's computing quite heavily, so it will drain your battery in like 10 minutes or something. But, but for kind of rare, rare uses, it's, it's pretty reasonable to run pretty expensive models on phones. And I think that will become cheaper over time as mobile phone manufacturers look to put sort of more interesting lower power hardware for accelerating neural nets on phones. Yeah? Sorry, just going back to the robots for a second. Are you commenting at all on uh, integrating TensorFlow, say, the loss um, yeah, so we are uh, not using ROS here, but we have it integrated with a different robotic operating system, okay. essentially generating, you know, so TensorFlow Ops in this system actually generate motor commands through the robotic, uh, lower level robotic software. Okay. Uh, and that seems to work reasonably well. It's pretty easy to add new ops for a particular robot. Um, we also have variants of this that do simulation of robots. So you can essentially have the same op with a simulated robot or a real robot that, just, that are just different kernels that are implementations of the same uh, higher level op, which is like control motor or something. Sure. Are you able to tell us what framework you're using for the robot? Uh, I actually don't know the name of this one. It was some custom thing that this robotics company developed. So it's not particularly interesting, but it would be pretty easy to add a similar thing for ROS or other robotic platforms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about the quantization, have you tried uh, getting away from uh, flows completely and use uh, integers instead, uh, especially uh, considering the fact that the Xeon Y is coming out, you know, and uh, they're just that uh, for, for training or for inference? For both. Uh, I know that there are some publication on it, but yeah, certainly for inference, we've been doing quantization to fixed point numbers, not, not floating point, for quite a while. Uh, training, it tends to be a little bit harder because the, the dynamic range you tend to want for the weights changes throughout the training process. Uh, and so it's a little finickier to get it to kind of stay in the right range and not overflow and not underflow. Uh, so one of the things, you know, not necessarily for this crowd, but there's a lot of interest in machine learning in general. And we think there's kind of a variety of different entry points for people with different levels of machine learning experience. Um, so our cloud uh, products are starting to offer sort of pre-trained models in different domains that do different kinds of interesting things that are generally applicable that you can use without any machine learning knowledge. Um, and then I think kind of a, a slightly more sophisticated user will move to something where they maybe reuse an existing model architecture and train it on their own data sets. Um, and that sort of requires some amount of understanding of machine learning training and so on, but requires less knowledge about how to actually generate new model architectures for particular problems. And then other people will want to do machine learning research to see what kinds of new models uh, make sense. Um, and I suspect people may move down this stack into growing sophistication over time. Uh, but just to give you an example of something that's pretty useful already, 
is the Cloud Vision API for people where essentially it's just a pre-trained vision model and you can say, you know, here's an image, give me good stuff out of it. And we can give you sort of whole image classification and we give uh, locations of different faces in the image and uh, some, some assessment of whether they're happy or sad. And we can read text in those images. And so you can see how people, even without machine learning knowledge, can just make an API call and get uh, good stuff. Um, more interesting, perhaps, for this group is our Cloud ML product, which is now an alpha. We have about 100 companies using it, or 100 customers of various kinds. Um, and it's essentially built around TensorFlow models. So you can express TensorFlow models and then say, please train this model and make it go fast for training, <laughs> where you can say, I'd like to use 50 devices or 100 devices, and it will take care of automatically rewriting the graph you give it to take advantage of those devices and hopefully uh, train things much more quickly for you. And it also will uh, offer a managed inference service. So once you've trained a model, you can say, now I want to serve this model, and it will automatically grow the amount of computation that's needed to serve the number of inference re requests you're getting uh, per second. Um, so, one of the nice things about open sourcing TensorFlow is that I think there's been a lot of interest and in, in use of, the, of the, the project in the external community as well. And so, for example, here's just a few examples of things that people have implemented using TensorFlow on GitHub. Uh, I, I actually made the slide last week, so I had to update it. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's a nice little re introduction to reinforcement learning game where you're supposed to eat the green dots and not the red. Um, the, someone has implemented the really cool uh, neural artwork uh, work that came out of the University of Tilburgen and Max Planck Institute, where you give it an image and a, and a painting and it renders the image in the style of the painter. Um, someone has a simple character RNN in TensorFlow. Uh, Keras is a popular library for giving higher level ways of expressing machine learning models. Originally developed to have Theano as the back end, but it can now also be used on top of TensorFlow. Um, the, someone has implemented the, the neural caption, captioning work. Um, and there's a group that's translating uh, TensorFlow into Mandarin. Uh, all the documentation and so on. Uh, so um, I think we'll, there's a few takeaways from this. One is by having model and data parallelism uh, really give you quick turnaround times on, on research uh, experiments and hypotheses, you actually can do much faster iteration in the machine learning research space. And I think that's been a pretty important uh, aspect of um, you know, a lot of the work that our, our group has done. I, I, I'm giving this talk mostly about the systems aspect because I figure you're getting a lot of coverage of the other machine learning research aspects uh, in the other parts of this, this course. But I think being able to take uh, an idea and go from that to having results uh, quickly really, really makes things better. Uh, we've been pretty happy with the TensorFlow open sourcing experience so far. We have a pretty pretty good community inside Google and outside uh, doing cool stuff with it, which is nice. Um, and, you know, from our view, you know, we see deep learning as kind of this thing that will actually be in lots and lots of different computational systems um, and will really have a big impact on lots of fields, robotics, self-driving cars, healthcare, video, dialogue systems, um, all kinds of things. And so, that really means uh, you all should do research in the field because it will have a lot, a lot of impact in the world, I guess, uh, in terms of what kinds of things um, we'll be able to do. Uh, I'd like to take a brief detour and talk about a residency program that we're running. Uh, so we, we decided we would start a residency program where people can come and spend a year in our group doing research, uh, learning to do machine learning research. Um, working with our researchers. And we had our first group of people, uh, they applied last fall and we made the decisions of who to accept. Uh, 
kind of in February, March, and then they started in, in early June. Uh, and so we have now 27 people in our group kind of uh, here for a year doing uh, all kinds of interesting research. Um, and uh, the, I think one of the really nice things is you get interesting problems and mentorship from our researchers and also uh, access to computational resources within, within Google to do that research. And the goal after a year is basically for people to have published you know, two or three papers uh, in, in you know, top conferences, post them on archive, uh, do all kinds of things like that. Uh, you know, we, we weren't quite sure who would apply. What we ended up with in terms of the people we accepted was um, a pretty broad mix. I'll show you in the next slide. Uh, and basically, you know, everyone in, who's taking this class is kind of the right sort of profile of who we were imagining. The current class of the 27 people that we accepted, uh, roughly a third have a master, have a bachelor's, a third have a master's, and a third have a and a post, or and or a postdoc. Um, and of of the whole class, half are coming straight from that level of education, uh, straight from school, and half have some post school working experience of some sort. Uh, and one of the things I really like is that we have a really broad mix of backgrounds in the program. So, it's probably a third computer scientists, a third math or stats or applied math people, and a handful of double E in physics and comp bio. Uh, there's someone from a finance background. Um, so it's, it's pretty nice when you bring together people with lots of different kinds of skills and expertise. I've always found that that's a, a really helpful thing because people often look at problems differently and uh, putting uh, sort of computational biology experience in conjunction with machine learning researchers and tackling comp bio problems or something, I think is a, the kind of thing that, that might come out of this and would be pretty interesting. Uh, we haven't quite decided on the opening date for applications, but it'll be sometime this fall and you can find information there. Uh, okay, and there's further reading and I'm ending early, which I guess is okay. We can just have an open discussion about uh, all kinds of things. Sure.